Hey there, I want to thank you for joining me today for our Tuesday night Bible study. I'm so grateful that you took the time. You know, as we're kind of surrounded by uh, some mixed metaphors, I guess you would say. We've got the, the posters, the pictures from Australia, and I've got a Super Bowl shirt on. We're here in, in my office over at the church. I got my, my Valentine's Day tree up, and oh, there's my, my lovely dove, dovely board that's kind of demonstrating for you what our lesson for today is. Well, first of all, let me tell you that we're over here in this space because we used our sanctuary this morning for a funeral for a very lovely member of the congregation that we're going to miss incredibly dearly. We have a policy because we take in the season of COVID-19 very seriously your safety and the protection of those who would worship at this church. We will not for 24 hours use our sanctuary or our building space because we basically spray down the entire space, clean all the surfaces, and then we let it set for a day before we come back again to use it all over again. So that's what we are doing to protect you, and that's why I'm here. I'm protecting myself, too. And so uh, that's why we're I'm over in this space. The reason why I'm wearing the shirt, hey, it's Super Bowl Sunday this week, right? And, of course, Valentine's Day is coming up. So there you go. Let's, uh, let's begin with prayer. We all agree on this. We are here to worship God. And we're here to, again, take the opportunity to open up the Holy Scriptures. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for your mercy, for your blessing. We pray for those who lost loved ones, especially the wonderful young woman that we had to bury this day, her children and her family. We ask your, your blessing to be with them. Uh, this is going to be a tough, tough road in front of them, living this life without her. And we just ask you continue to be with them. May your spirit fall upon them right now. May you also be with us as we open up the Holy Scripture. And I pray that this lesson today would be a blessing to somebody who is in need. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are going to take a look at our lesson from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 8, 1 to 13 today. And so let me start by setting a scenario. Paul, you know, the... the uh, Paul is writing to the Corinthians. The Corinthians were very troublesome people because um, lots of conflict. Christians had different opinions and they were just warring with each other about these opinions. And so Paul continues to come back to the same theme over and over and over again. I bet you you won't guess what that theme is. So I'm going to give you kind of a hint and maybe there is, is a method to my madness of being here today. Hmm, what do you think? Paul's theme is for today. Look at that. Do you like my special effect? Ooh, hey, we should do this more often. All right. This is a theme he keeps coming back to over and over again. In fact, if you might remember, 1 Corinthians is the, the, the book that has that famous love poem that we read at weddings. Trust me, it's not meant to be a wedding love poem from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's not a wonderful, sappy little love poem written for a wedding circumstance. It's, 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 this, this book is a book about people ready to kill each other because they can't stand each other. Christians who are ready to kill each other because they have so much disagreement about so many things. And Paul is like, oh, good grief. <laughs> And so he keeps coming back at this lesson of what again? Special effect again. That's right. Bam, bam. Well, that's kind of like a heart beating, right? We need to love each other because this is the most important thing. And so he tries to attack this theme on multiple different ways. Now, one of the things, just to set the scenario for today's lesson, he's dealing with food sacrificed to idols. Now Paul knows that there's no such thing as an idol. <laughs> they aren't real. They're just inanimate objects. And so food that is sacrificed to an idol, who cares? You can eat it and you're not going to go and burn in hell. Now you have some Christians today who are very literalistic who would say, oh, you ate of something that's evil and it's possessed by sin. Paul's like, oh good grief. Come on people. Grow up. It's just food that was sacrificed to an idol that isn't real. <clears throat> if you eat it, you're not going to go and burn in hell. It isn't going to happen, okay? It's just food. However, Paul wants to caution people that knowledge is a dangerous thing. 
especially when it's used in an unloving fashion. So let's take a look at this. So remember, Paul is laying out his position that he's got knowledge. Food sacrifice idols is just food. Big deal. That's the knowledge that he's talking about. But listen to how he treats this. Now, concerning food sacrifice idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Seems like, again, a non sequitur, but I've already set this up for you about the knowledge that he has that food sacrifice idols, no big deal, just food. We all have knowledge. We all have our nice little bit of knowledge like this, and we all like to press that little bit of knowledge like we know everything, right? You know, it's like <laughs> we're, we're, we got the Super Bowl party again. We, we used to always have every uh, Sunday during Super Bowl. It's not going to happen this year. But you always have those people that seem to know everything about football. Why? Because my next door neighbor was Franco Harris, so I know everything about football. Okay, well, I'm really impressed that you had Franco Harris as your, as your neighbor, and that's awesome. But that doesn't mean you know anything about football. But what we do is we take this little bit of knowledge or that little bit of information that we have, and we make it like this, like we know everything there is to know, and we want to impose that upon everybody to shut them up as though we're the experts. This is how we news, use knowledge. This is how we use knowledge in politics. Just look at the inanities that are said on your Facebook page. Your Facebook page. Don't look at somebody else's. I'm talking to you, whoever you happen to be. Because if you're putting political posts on, I guarantee your political posts are just filled with a bunch of inanities and stupidities. Because you have this much knowledge that you want to make it look like you're this smart. Okay, this is what Paul's talking about. We all have this much knowledge. We all want to make ourselves feel like we're this smart. All right? Knowledge puffs up. Puffs me up like I know something that you don't know. And we use it against other people. I'm so smart. You know, I'm going to tell you some words that should never, ever. Well, let me use just one word. For those of you who are political posters, that should never, ever, ever come out of your mouth. I saw a pastor's wife who's actually related to me, who uses this word all the time of people who disagree with her opinion. That is such an unkind and unloving, ungenerous thing to say about somebody. Oh, they're a sheeple because they have a different opinion than me because I'm so much smarter than you. Really? Are you really so much smarter than me? Are you really so much smarter than people who have a different political opinion than you? No. This, this type of language should never be in the heart and the mouth of a Christian. Ever! Okay? Never. Because listen to how Paul's dealing with this. Knowledge puffs up. So you got a little bit of knowledge, you're going to treat everybody around you like they're idiots and stupids. Stupid. If you're ever using the word, you're an idiot, you're a sheeple, you're stupid, you know... These are things that you need to get rid of out of your vocabulary. If you use those words, oh, I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't even, I try not to pay attention to these words. I, I, I don't know what Democrats who hate Republicans call Republicans, Republicans or whatever they call them, or Republicans or whatever they call Democrats. I, I, I can't remember what they call them because they're just, they're just wrong, they're rude. Stop diminishing people because they disagree with your opinion. It's not knowledge. You think you have knowledge. You know this much. That's what you know. And you're puffing yourself up like you know everything. You don't. Knowledge puffs up. What does love do? Love builds up. Knowledge puffs up to your own opinion of yourself. Love builds up other people. Anyone, verse 2, who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. What? Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. What Paul is basically saying to you is that if you think you know it all, well, you know what? You really don't. Because the person who actually starts to learn something admits absolute ignorance. That's the beginning of wisdom. When you recognize, I just don't know it all. 
I don't have all the answers. I need you. Oh my goodness, think what a world we'd live in if we actually said that about one another. I realize as I study this, I just don't have all the answers. And my tribe, my Democrats, my Republicans, don't have all the answers either. Wouldn't that be grand if we actually just listen to each other and build each other up? I can dream. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. Read that over and over and over and over again. If you were sticking in other people's face about how stupid they are, you don't know anything because you haven't learned what you really need to learn in life. Verse 3, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Do you see how he twists that? Oh, Paul does this little twist here. See, you want to know something so you can use it against people. But, listen to this again. For anyone who loves God is known by him. What really is important is not how much you think you know, but how much you love God and that you are known by God. So stop focusing on, I need knowledge so I can puff myself up and prove to you how smart I am. Start focusing on loving God. Verse 4. Hence, as the eating of food offered idols, and he's finally, Paul's finally getting to, he's laid the foundation for what he wants to prove to you. As to the eating of food offered idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists. This is what I said at the beginning of our lesson today. That there's no God but one God. There's no idols. If there's food offered to idols, we, it's not demon-possessed. It's not evil food. It's just food. Okay? Indeed, even though there are so-called gods in heaven and are on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords from whom are all things and for whom we exist, but there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ, to whom we are all things through, through whom are all things and through whom, whom we exist. That's kind of a confusing thing. Basically, Paul is saying, yeah, you know, the, Lord, the world sets up its, its list of, of people and authority and lords and gods and blah, 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 blah. But in the end, there's only one true Lord of the universe, and that's the God that we serve. Okay, so that's what he's saying there. Verse 7, it is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. So he said, this is one piece of knowledge you do have. That there is only one God. Not everybody believes it. People might believe there are multiple gods. People might believe there's another God other than our, our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? He's not indicting them. They just aren't at that point in their journey and their relationship with God. We want to make it as though they're demon-possessed or evil or something. They're just on a journey. And God is good and gracious and kind. So let's go on. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food that they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak, it is therefore defiled. So, they, again, Paul's talking about baby Christians. They've just come to a relationship with Christ. But they still think maybe there's some other gods. And, you know, you have these people of wisdom and knowledge saying, there's no other gods, that's kind of stupid. Why would you think that? We use our knowledge to bash them, right? Paul said, don't do that to them. They're still struggling with these things. They're on a journey. They've taken one step on a journey. You might be further along in the journey. They're this far along in the journey. Don't apply your knowledge to them or act like they should know that. They're not there yet. They're growing. So what does Paul say? What should we do about this? If they're still struggling with food that's been offered to idols, so you can imagine maybe somebody at a big fellowship meal brought in food that day. They worked at the temple because that's, you know, hey, who cares? I'm working at the temple, big deal, and I'm bringing in some food that was offered to idols, whatever, for a fellowship meal. And a baby Christian says, <gasps> how can you do that? I'm going to be defiled if I eat that. Well, come on, you're not going to be defiled. It's just, it's just food, whatever. What Paul is saying, we should be considerate of the baby Christian who's still struggling with these things in their life. So listen to what Paul says. Food will not bring us close to God. We're no worse off whether we eat this food or don't eat it. 
but take care that this liberty of yours is not somehow becoming a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if others see you, you who possesses knowledge, you who are wise, you who know that it's just food that's offered to an idol and it's not real, okay? For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food, sacrifice, and idols? And so by this knowledge, those who are weak believers for whom Christ has died are therefore destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Oh, okay. This, huh, this is the money shot right here, okay? What Paul is trying to do is, if you are the one you think you are the one that has knowledge, and you're looking at everybody else and expecting them to act like you do, you don't have any knowledge. Okay? Because you don't understand. Oh! There it is, my special effect. What this is. Okay? You don't understand what this is. This is the most important thing. This is the most important thing, not our knowledge. And if you're using your knowledge and it's hurting somebody else, in particular a baby Christian, guess who's responsible for that? You are. You know, I... <clears throat> hmm. There are many Christians who believe they have word of knowledge from God. And they have maybe have certain bigotries against certain groups of people. Let's use one an example. Those who are homosexuals. In some churches, some, not ours, homosexuals are welcome in our church. You're welcome to be full members of our church. You're welcome to commune at our church. We've had council members in our church who are homosexuals. I've had a transgender male, president of the congregation. Okay? But, that's our perspective. I will defend that. There are some churches, however, that take homosexuals. They basically wrap um, duct tape around them or, or bubble wrap around them and they say you're welcome at our church but we're going to bubble wrap you first and seal you off from every member of the church and we're going to duct tape you to the wall so that you don't uh, uh, so you don't bring that into our sanctuary and make everybody else impure around you and then when you repent and you become like us and you straighten yourself out then we will take that duct tape off and we'll take you off the wall and we'll pull that uh, you know bubble wrap off of you and then you can join the rest of us once you're like all of us okay I cannot tell you how much harm and heartache has been caused by churches that have done that people have been turned away from Jesus Christ people will say what you don't love me as though you're somehow better than me and they go and they seek something else a word of hope and love from somebody else. Or maybe they turned to atheism, in case of a friend of mine, that's what he did, because of how his church treated him when he came out and revealed to them he was gay. He thought it would be a loving place. Churches have forgotten that this is what we're about. It's not about getting people straight or in order or to have the knowledge that we have. People are all in different places in their journey. And this is the most important thing that we have to offer to people. And when we're surrounding people with bubble wrap and duct taping them to a wall, this isn't being heard. Okay? You would impose your knowledge upon them before you show them love. Or you think you're being loving by imposing your knowledge upon them. This is not what Paul says. Now, you may disagree with my opinion about uh, homosexuality. I, I, okay, that's fine. We'll have that discussion. I think I can, I, I, I'm willing to go uh, and talk about that in terms of my perspective of the Bible. 
And I do take the Bible very seriously, by the way. So don't just go and quote one passage of Scripture at me and say, there, that proves it. No, it doesn't. I believe that this is the Word of God and God is speaking to us. I also understand that as the Word of God, we should always use the knowledge and the gift that God gives us to love people. This is what Paul is saying. Okay? Let me finish our lesson. When you, the person who thinks he have knowledge, sins by pushing away a baby Christian who's been hurt because you've been so puffed up in your knowledge that you've tried to impose your knowledge upon them, okay? When you thus sin against that member of your family and wound their conscience, when it is weak, you sin against Jesus Christ. Therefore, if food is the cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fail. You know, you can use this lesson in so many different ways. Maybe it's about alcohol. <laughs> You've got somebody who's struggling with alcohol and uh, a baby Christian that uh, is getting their life together and they're going through AA process and, and, and it's a long, hard journey for them. But then you in a very cavalier way, well, it's not a problem for me, so I'm going to go drink in front of them. And that person starts to drink again. Guess who's responsible for that? You are. You got a baby Christian and they're homosexual and you just want to keep bearing with near knowledge about what you know and you push them away from Christ. Well, at least I've told them, right? You puff yourself up. I told them. You're going to be responsible for pushing them away from Jesus Christ. <laughs> we need to be careful that we understand that knowledge is not the important thing. My special effect again. What is? The Bible doesn't say you will be known by your knowledge. You'll be known by what? We'll be known by our love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you want this world to know us by our love. I know there's a whole bunch of Christians, but, 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 what about this knowledge? What about this? What about that? It doesn't matter. People can't come to Jesus Christ in a relationship with you if they don't see love. If all we do is we puff ourselves up and justify our, our opinions on the basis of our knowledge and we start calling people sheeple and stupid and idiots, how is that reflecting the love of Jesus Christ? If we expect people to transform their lives before we show them kindness and say, well, that's tough love. That's not tough love. That's cruelty and unkindness. And it pushes people away from Jesus. Help us to be known by love, God. Help us to be known by our kindness. Help us to come to that point in life where we recognize that pff, I don't know anything. Okay, I know a little bit. I know that God loves me. You know what? And that's enough. And that's the message that we were called to proclaim. Help us, God, to be better lovers of those around us so that Jesus might truly be made known. For it is in your precious name we pray. Amen. Listen, I know I may have stirred the pot a little bit today. Well, that's my intention. That's what Bible study is for. Maybe I've upset and angered a few of you. I'm okay with that. I can live with that. I would like to have some of these discussions with you. Respect me enough to call me and tell me. Let's have these discuss discussions. Because you know what? This is the most important thing. I'm going to try as hard as I can to respond to you in this manner, and I hope that you will do me the kindness of doing the same thing, because I'm also a frail human being who needs that in my life. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.